Hi, welcome to ESI 412 Nanotechnology, Materials, Infrastructure and Safety. I am Professor Ukjun Nam at the Pennsylvania State University and I will teach this course. This is the first unit, uh, General Perspectives, and Professor Steve Fonesh at the Pennsylvania State University uh, will teach the first three lectures. This is the outline for the course. We're going to cover general safety awareness, wet chemistry safety, gas safety, biological safety, nanomaterial safety, energy safety, and environmental concerns. And we begin with these topics because safety is paramount when you are working in the area of nanotechnology. You must be careful of the chemistry that you're dealing with. You must be careful of what we're doing to the environment. Uh, so safety is paramount, and so we begin with these safety issues. So general safety awareness starts with you, uh, the person who is in the lab, in the manufacturing facility, uh, in the factory, using nanotechnology. Personal safety basics uh, begin with personal protective equipment. And this includes uh, things such as glasses that obviously protect the eyes, gloves to protect the skin, aprons to protect the overall body. Uh, you have to have these things, uh, and in certain circumstances they are mandatory. Uh, it's mandatory that they be used. And you must be well trained in safety when you work in the area of nanotechnology. You must be trained in the use of the personal protective equipment, the safety devices, and in safe work practices. So some safety basics. There's some things that just should be found throughout a lab or a manufacturing site. Uh, for example, first aid materials, including calcium agglutinate. It, that's a gel which is very, very um, effective against burns for, uh, from hydrofluoric acid. And we'll discuss that uh, again in a, in a moment. Obviously, fire extinguishers. I say obviously because they should be in any lab and in any uh, manufacturing site. So that's a basic. Uh, safety showers. Again, very important in nanotechnology because of the chemicals that you might be dealing with, uh, the possibility of getting some of these chemicals uh, on oneself, and uh, a way to quickly remove uh, these materials with a, with a shower. So safety showers around the lab or manufacturing facility are a must. Eye wash stations, again, are a must because the eyes are so important and uh, can again be subject to uh, the different chemicals. And then there should be chemical spill and cleaning kits, uh, kits for, that are available for cleaning up any sort of spills that may take, take place. So these items should be in a laboratory or a manufacturing facility, and they should be clearly identified so people know where they are and, and what they are. Here are some safety basics, some pictures of them. You can see the, on the left the shower uh, and the, the water uh, there for washing uh, your hands, for example. You can see in the middle an eye wash uh, facility. You can see a fire extinguisher. Again, another shower, the, the uh, glutinate gel, calcium glutinate gel. Again, very necessary if you're dealing with hydrofluoric acid. And then a general safety facility shown there, which is a hood to contain chemicals and to contain any sort of uh, particles that might be in the air. So materials, what kind of materials are we dealing with in nanotechnology? Well, we're dealing with a lot of chemicals. These could be liquids, gases, solids, uh, and they're used in various aspects of nanofabrication. And they can, or at least many of them can be, uh, hazardous. They can be toxic, they can be corrosive, they can be irritants, they can be flammable, 
They can be pyrophoric. They can be explosives. They can be asphyxiate, asphyxiates. So uh, lots of possibilities. The government has created what's called the Right to Know Act. So when you're in a laboratory or you're in a manufacturing facility, you have the right to know what is there uh, with you and this information is provided through documents called Material Safety Data Sheets, uh, MSDS Sheets. And as I said, these are required by law uh, to be in any laboratory or manufacturing facility where materials are used uh, that uh, could possibly be uh, detrimental to your health or your safety. Now this is, the, the, these MSDS sheets are not just for nanotechnology, they are mandated by the government for any laboratory or manufacturing facility and of course we're especially uh, aware of them and uh, especially uh, we especially view them as very important in nanotechnology. So here is a, a typical uh, uh, situation where you would find these MSDS sheets posted. Uh, here they're attached to the wall in a uh, very obvious display. So you see these yellow binders which contain safety data sheets on all the different materials that are in this particular laboratory or uh, manufacturing site. And of course, as I said, this is mandated by the government for all laboratories and manufacturing sites and we're particularly uh, aware of this and particularly uh, and we particularly view this as very important in nanofabrication nanotechnology. So the, these sheets have mandated content and what you commonly find is the product identification and uh, you find uh, it hazardous identification that is, is it uh, um, dangerous to health? Is the material flammable, uh, et cetera? Uh, you also find exposure limits. In other words, what the government believes uh, are the permissible exposure limits that can be uh, experienced by an individual. And then there's a threshold limit value, what the government believes based on current research is the threshold limit that you should not exceed. Then there's information on handling and storage and information on personal protection. And again, as I said, this is uh, mandated for all sorts of laboratories and manufacturing facilities and uh, are particularly of interest to us in nanotechnology because we really believe safety and environmental concerns are paramount. Continuing with the content on these MSDS sheets, there's preventative measures, um, facility and equipment requirements, uh, cleanup procedures, exposure control, in other words, first aid uh, recommendations. There is a listing of the physical and chemical properties of, of the material. Uh, and there's information on the stability and the reactivity of the material. Uh, this toxicolog toxicological information, ecological information, disposal considerations, transportation information, and regulatory information. The latter refers to government regulations on handling these materials. And by the way, you see on this view graph information on the site you can go to to further uh, delve into this uh, this very important area of MSDS sheets. Now the terminology that is used in these sheets uh, is very important to us uh, and we'll just go over this terminology, just develop a little bit of this vocabulary uh, so that uh, when we're looking at MSDS sheets uh, in a lab or in a, in a uh, uh, fabrication facility, uh, we, we understand what the words mean. Uh, the term irritant, for example, is commonly used. Uh, that's a chemical that can cause a reversible inflammation of tissue. Uh, they can affect the skin, eyes, mucous membranes, 
or the respiratory tract, uh, and exposure to irritants may not result in instant inflammation. So there could be a, a delay time, which is an important aspect to keep in mind. So there, some of these chemicals can be irritants. Some of them can be mutagens. Now, this is any substance that causes an increase in the rate of change in the genes. The genes can change, but their change can be artificially stimulated by these chemicals called mutagens. And mutagens can cause mutations in the genes that can be passed on as cells reproduce in the future. So cell lines that contain mutagens can turn into tumors or cancers. So materials that fall into this classification are materials that obviously demand considerable uh, careful attention. Uh, Teratogens are another type of material that we, uh, that we must keep a very close eye on. These are any substance that prevents the proper formation of an embryo. Um, viruses can do that, radiation can do that, and there are chemicals that can be teratogens. Uh, the, these chemicals or these types of viruses or these types of radiation exposures can damage reproductive and endocrine, that is, hormonal systems and can affect, as we say, embryo development. Now, carcinogens are substances <coughs> that control or that cause uncontrolled cell proliferation. In other words, these materials can lead to cancer. And uh, some carcinogens can also be mutagens or, or teratogens. So another very dangerous class of, or, or class of materials. Sensitizers are chemicals that cause a person to develop an allergenic reaction after repeated exposure in normal healthy tissue. They cause a hypersensitivity, uh, so it, it, the exposure to these can make uh, you develop allergies, can make you develop hypersensitivities into different situations. Well, all these chemicals um, need to be carefully stored, uh, and there's lots of different uh, uh, storage facilities available in, in a <coughs> excuse me laboratory or in a fabrication facility and you see these different kinds of facilities here's a chemical hood but the point is the storage is underneath here which is what's be, what is being shown here underneath a lot of these hoods you often find these storage facilities uh, for keeping these chemicals uh, in a very carefully controlled situation so that if any vapors were to escape, they go into the hood and then are taken out of the laboratory or fabrication facility. Well, when we're dealing with chemicals, we also have to worry about whether these chemicals get along or not with one another. In other words, it's a question of chemical compatibility. Uh, so some materials might be safe, but they can become extremely hazardous in combination with other materials. Uh, so we have to be very aware of that. So it's important to understand chemical compatibility in the laboratory or in the fabrication facility. And uh, also, obviously, if there is incompatibility and some reactions take place, what level of material exposure is, is safe? When we're dealing with chemistry and materials processing, as, as we are in nanotechnology, nanofabrication is using chemicals and materials and to make things at the nanoscale, we have to worry about chemical waste disposal. And that's something that one has to be very careful about from the point of view of safety and from the point of view of the environmental impact. So you have to have facilities for disposing of these chemicals. And here you see a disposal uh, vehicle here, a disposal container, uh, and you see a label on it. And on this label has to be the full chemical name uh, so that people know what's in this disposal container. And it, the name must be on the label along with uh, the, how much is 
in this uh, the disposal container. So if you look more closely, information has to be put on here. So you must have it filled out and play and the, uh, the information must be on this label must be on the plastic disposable container. Plastic is used because it's generally inert. Um, and you must, before you use the bottle, you must rinse it uh, at least three times with DI water. And the cap on the bottle must be replaced with a vented cap. In other words, this disposal uh, vehicle or disposal container must have a, a vented cap so that if some chemical reaction does take place inside here, the, uh, and, and if gaseous materials are produced by the reaction, they can escape. And of course, as we saw, these types of disposal containers are kept underneath hoods so that if any gas does escape through the cap, it then is captured by the hood and uh, taken out of the lab or fabrication facility. Here you see these uh, disposal containers, or in this case they're bottles because they're containing liquids, and you see them placed in a secondary containment uh, vehicle. Uh, and this is done to make sure that if anything were to happen, you still have them contained. Uh, and then you see the caps. These caps are, are placed on here. These are caps that have vents built in them that I mentioned earlier. These are kept underneath a hood, and so if any vapors do escape, they're taken out of the lab or the fabrication facility. And we always have to be careful that we don't mix chemicals. So acids, bases, solvents, they're all kept in, in separate containment all the time. So you would never have acids and solvents together, certainly not in a, in a bottle and certainly not even in the same secondary uh, containment vessel. Solid waste disposal, well, not everything is a gas, not everything is a liquid, and so there can be uh, a lot of solid waste that one has to dispose of in a lab or in a fabrication facility. There can be broken glass and other sorts of solid materials that have to be contained, and there can be leftover solid materials, solid chemicals, solid reactants, these must be collected, contained, and disposed of uh, properly also. Well, <clears throat> we've gone over some general safety awareness uh, concerns. Let's now talk about some wet chemistry safety. So let's talk about safety guidelines at the wet bench. So the wet bench is where we do wet chemistry. Since we're dealing with liquids, uh, safety glasses should be used at all times. We don't want liquids to splash or, or uh, particles, uh, little droplets of the liquids to come up into the air and uh, get into the eyes. So always use safety glasses when working at a wet bench. And the face shield is also uh, used, uh, especially with certain chemicals. Aprons are used with certain chemicals and protective nitrile gloves should be used, uh, especially when working with corrosive chemicals. And we've said this before, but you can't say it too many times, always keep acids, bases, and solvents in separate storage areas under the wet bench. So here's someone fully attired to work at the workbench and to deal with corrosive materials. You can see the face shield, <clears throat> Excuse me, there are safety glasses under the face shield there that the person is wearing. An apron, uh, and you can see the nitrile gloves that are being worn for protecting the skin. Uh, some basic safety guides that uh, always need to be thought of in, in the back of the mind when you're working in a lab or a fabrication facility. You always want to add the chemical that you're adding to water. You always want to add the chemi chemical first so that if there's any heat of reaction, when chemicals come into water, often there's a heat of, heat of uh, reaction that takes place either when the chemicals meet one another or sometimes just dissolving in water can produce an endothermic reaction. That is a reaction that gives off heat. 
So you want the heat to, to be dissipated in the water. Uh, so that's why you put the chemicals into the water and not the other way around. If you did it the other way around, and you put the water into a chemical, and if there's some endothermic reaction, that is some reaction that produces heat, it could uh, vaporize the water, and that could come up and cause problems as bad as problems to your breathing or to your uh, uh, body. So you don't want that sort of thing to happen. You always uh, want to discard aqueous chemicals, that is chemicals that are in a water solution in properly labeled plastic waste containers. We mentioned before that plastics are used because they are generally inert. So most of your disposal containers are will be plastic. And before you use a new waste container, as we had said before, and it obviously applies when you're dealing with wet chemistry, be sure that the container has been cleaned, rinsed out, uh, at least three times with deionized water before you use it uh, as a storage vessel or storage container. Now, corrosive materials are generally, well, first of all, they're, they're bad, dangerous, and they're generally uh, strong acids and, and bases. Um, these can cause very serious burns and eye injuries, so they're very dangerous. and. Uh, they're chemically reactive. They can react with um, inadvertently with other things that are in your wet bench that you don't want them to react with. So uh, you have to be very, very careful with these materials. Uh, as we said, they can be acids. That is, they can be acidic or they can be bases. That is, they can be basic. Uh, and they can include things like uh, hydrofluoric acid, uh, commonly known as HF. Uh, which is used a lot in nanofabrication, uh, especially when you want to etch silicon dioxide. And uh, hydrofluoric acid is extremely dangerous. We'll come back to talking about specifically this acid in a moment. Your corrosives could include sulfuric acid, nitric acid, hydrochloric acid, and they can be bases like sodium hydroxide, a common base that's used in processing and ammonium hydroxide is another commonly used base. So these are just some examples of corrosive materials and, and some examples of corrosive materials in particular that one encounters in, in nanotechnology and, and, and in, in, in nanofabrication. Now pH is, is a way to, to quantify the degree to which a chemical is an acid or a base. And uh, it's, it was invented to have a precise quantification of acidity and basic behavior. And it's a log to the base 10, it's more precisely the negative log to the base 10, of the concentration of protons, that is hydrogen ions, H plus, uh, in a solution. And the concentration is given in, in moles per liter. So the formal definition, as you can see there in our view graph, is that uh, pH is minus the log, and of course that means log to the base 10, when you don't explicitly show the 10 like that, it means log to the base 10, of the concentration of the um, number of protons, that is hydrogen ions, in solution, specifically given in moles per liter, uh, or can be written as the logs of the base 10 of the reciprocal of that concentration of protons, as you see expressed mathematically. So this is a way to quantify how much a material, or how acidic a material is, or how basic a material is. And this is used around the world so everyone knows uh, how to uh, interpret pH numbers, and everyone around the world appreciates that if a pH is, is below 7, then the, then the material is acidic, and if the pH is above 7, then it's basic. And 7 is the pH of water. Uh, so there's an order of magnitude difference uh, generally in the pH scale. People usually say, they usually don't give, um, you know, 
pH 6.23 or something like that. We usually talk about pHs of 7, 6, 5, 8, 9, usually whole numbers. Just by convention, I guess we could say. Here's a look at the pH scale. Now I'm going to put my glasses on so I can look closely at this too. I always find this scale very interesting. Um, let's see, here's pure water at 7. We said that was the age of 7. And uh, that's called neutral. And as we said, the numbers that are less than 7 are acidic materials. And when the pHs are larger than 7, we said those are basic materials. And we said this is a scale everyone around the world uses. And um, you can see the various common materials that we all know. For example, we all have experienced an, uh, an acid stomach. And you can see generally where that is in the pH scale, somewhere around uh, between two and three, and uh, we, we know that physicians use pH, that's it's important in medicine, uh, to keep track of if your body functions are correct and what the pH should be. Uh, and as we see here, if the pH is too high in your stomach, you have stomach acid. Uh, pH is a very important in medicine and in biology in general. You can see that if the pH gets too low, you can see between 4 and 5 you have, uh, it affects fish reproduction. Uh, you can see if the pH gets between 3 and 4, you can actually kill off fish. So this is a real clear example of how we can mess up the environment with chemicals. Um, so turning from medicine and biology, let's look at food. You can see that uh, vinegar has a pH of 3, Coca-Cola or Pepsi-Cola, uh, not to specifically focus on one particular brand, but colas in general are somewhere between 2 and 3, as you can see there. Uh, baking soda, again used in cooking, is, uh, it's, an, it's obviously a base, excuse me, a base, and it's somewhere between 8 and 9. So you can see that uh, the common substances where they fall on the scale, battery acid, for example, has low, very low pH. You can see that uh, ammonia, which is used in the household, uh, found in many households and used for cleaning, has a pH of 12. It's a relatively strong base. And you can see sodium hydroxide there, one molar, very strong base. And you can see one molar hydrochloric acid very strong acid. So this pH scale is, is a very uh, important in helping us uh, understand the degree to which a material is an acid or a base. So acids are materials that have very large H plus ion content. You can realize that from the definition of pH. Remember, it was minus the log of the concentration, or an easier way to view it was log of 1 over the concentration of protons. So if you have a very large concentration of protons, then 1 over that's going to be small, and the log is going to be small. So you can see that if you have a lot of protons, a high concentration of protons, then you're going to be dealing with an acid. So any substance uh, which has a large concentration of protons is going to have a pH less than 7, and it's going to be what we call an acid. Now, there's a more general definition of acids than that based on the pH, and it's the bronsted lowry definition. And it's been generalized. It generalizes the whole idea of an acid to say it's a substance that's capable of donating a proton. And you can see where this generalization came from, because obviously acids have a lot of protons. Uh, therefore, they can donate those protons to chemical reactions. So the definition of an acid has been general, generalized with this bronsted lowry definition of simply saying an acid is a substance that is capable of donating a proton. <clears throat> Here are some acids. Uh, just as examples, 
and uh, here's hydrogen chloride, which is a gas. And uh, if you dissolve that gas in water, then it, dis it dissociates into protons, H+, plus, we said that was a proton, and chlorine ions. And you can see the chemical reaction there. So if the HCl as a gas is put into water, uh, by the way, that's an exothermic reaction. Remember, we were talking about reactions where you put things into water and energy is released. So if you put HCl, the gas, into water, you know, the HCl, the molecule breaks up into the proton, and the proton gets surrounded by water molecules, uh, and then a chlorine ion, and it gets surrounded by water molecules. So they're separated from one another. They sort of have a like a shield of water molecules around each one. So the proton is positive, you see the plus. The chlorine is negative, you see the minus sign. And together, the, the overall situation is neutral, as the original molecule was. But now you have these individual positive entities and negative entities. The positive entity is our proton. And the proton can get into chemical reactions, as we said. And there's lots of them around that's an acid. And here's sulfuric acid. As another example, that's a liquid, uh, and uh, we see H2SO4, which is the uh, chemical uh, uh, symbol way of writing sulfuric acid. And uh, if we put that into water, uh, it's a liquid, but if we put it into the liquid water, again, it's an exothermal reaction, by the way, and you get the protons surrounded by water molecules sort of like shielded by water molecules. And then you get the sulfate uh, radical. And you see that on the right side of that equation, also surrounded by water molecules. That sulfate radical uh, will then break down further in water, releasing another proton. And the sulfate radical, SiO4 minus. So you see that uh, you have a situation where, again, the water forms these protons, these uh, hydrogen ions, which uh, are available for chemical reaction, uh, and then the corresponding uh, other radical that, together, which, uh, when you put the proton and the other radical together, you come back to the original molecule. So lots of neat things happen here. You can see in water, uh, how the water breaks the molecule down and you have the protons readily available for chemical reaction. Here's a hydrofluoric acid. We said that that's uh, available many, in many, many cases in nanofabrication facilities, whether they're labs or whether they are uh, fabrication facilities. Uh, used, uh, it is used to etch silicon dioxide. And silicon dioxide is the world's best, just, just about the world's best dielectric. That is, it's very high electrical resistance, very good strength in terms of electrical breakdown. So it's an excellent dielectric, because that's why it's around so much in nanofabrication. So HF is used to, hydrofluoric acid is used to etch it, and uh, we have to pay a special we have to be especially sensitive to this chemical, as I mentioned several times, because it's, uh, it can really attack the skin. And uh, it's very dangerous because it can attack nerve endings. And you may not even know that you have an HF burn on your skin because the nerves may not be responding properly. So it's a very dangerous material. <coughs> Excuse me. We mentioned that. Uh, the uh, way to treat hydrofluoric acid is uh, immediately uh, use this calcium glutinate uh, gel that we talked about earlier. So if you have an HF uh, exposure, you should watch, wash the effective, uh, affected area with water and apply this calcium glutinate gel. And that should always be kept near the wet bench. Again, remember, we're talking about safety because that's the first thing we need to talk about nanotechnology, I have to talk about safety. And here's an example of how we having a properly um, developed lab, uh, a properly 
facilitated lab with the chemical, uh, the proper safety uh, equipment, the, the safety procedures. Here's an example of how it's so important. Uh, if one has an HF exposure, then you have to have facilities for getting uh, a wash station for, for the water, and you have to have this calcium glutinate gel available, uh, readily available for treating uh, this exposure. And then you must get to the hospital, because as we said, this is very insidious because it can attack nerve endings and you don't realize how extensive the exposure has been. So here's the gel. Again, remember we're stressing safety in this lecture, we're stressing safety in this unit. And here you see the gel uh, located at the wet bench okay, and uh, obviously labeled, uh, clearly labeled, and obviously available for immediate use. Uh, and it's a kind of safety procedure, safety precaution that must be taken in all aspects of nanotechnology. Just a good example of how you have to be prepared. Now bases, we talked about acids a lot. We're talking about bases. Uh, let's talk about bases now. And these uh, increase the concentration of the uh, OH radical, or OH ions. Now if you think, if you take a proton H plus and put it together with an OH minus, and then you have a neutral substance, which is water. Uh, neutral electrically, but it's also neutral from the sense of it isn't a base and it isn't an acid. So water is a combination of the protons and the hydroxyl ions, uh, one to one. When you get that, you have a neutral substance. It isn't an acid, it isn't a base. And electrically, it's neutral because you've got the H plus and the OH minus. So this hydroxyl ion is the signature ion for bases, just like with the H plus was the signature ion of an acid, it's the OH minus ion that is the signature of, of a base. And if you have a pH greater than 7, the substance is considered to be a base. And then there is a also generalized definition of bases uh, based on the Bronsted-Lowry uh, approach. That is, a base is a substance that is capable of accepting a proton. Obviously, something with a lot of OH minuses can accept a lot of H pluses and produce a lot of water. So you can see how this, uh, this a substance with a lot of OH minuses can accept a lot of protons. The result, of course, would be the production of a lot of water. So here's some examples of bases. Here's sodium, hydroxide, sodium hydroxide. There it is written in its chemical symbols, NaOH. And uh, <clears throat> we can talk about it dissolving in water also. It's a solid, as you see here at room temperature. So in lab conditions, you'd expect it to be solid. If you put it into water, it dissociates, dissociates into the sodium ion, positive ion, and the OH radical, the OH, the hydroxyl ion, OH negative. Again, that dissociation in the solvent, the solvent is water, that dissociation produces heat, it's exothermal. So this gets back to our safety considerations. Uh, one is exothermal reactions, we have to worry about that heat not vaporizing the water, we talked about that. And of course, it's just a general uh, corrosive nature of the base. So some bases like ammonia uh, <clears throat> are basic because when you, even though the uh, chemical symbol doesn't show any OH, uh, radicals, uh, their bases because as soon as you put them into water, you get the OH radical produced immediately. So if you put ammonia into water, it dissociates, but also there's a slight rearrangement that takes place with the water molecule, and you get the ammonium ion. Notice the name change, ammonia, NH3, you get the ammonium ion, which is NH4+, plus, and then the, the hydroxyl ion, OH-, minus. The OH minus, of course, is the signature of a base. And so ammonia then produces a lot of OH radicals, which is, as we said, the, the feature that makes a material uh, a base. Solvents, well, we've been talking about solvents. We've talked about water. And solvents are compounds uh, that uh, don't change 
but they uh, combine with other chemicals uh, make a solution. So you have this solvent and it dissolves something and that something it dissolves is called a solute and uh, there's a lot of different solvents around. You have to be careful though. Uh, some are flammable, some can volatilize, and some are potentially explosive. Uh, water, we've talked about water as being a great solvent, uh, and uh, when you're using water, you want to use deionized water, but you don't want it to contain any materials initially. You want it to be free of anything except water. And deionized water is very special water. There's no impurities in it, so that's a really good solvent. We'll come back and talk about that in a minute. Acetone is another, isopropyl alcohol is another, trichloroethylene is another, and ethyl, ethylene glycol, a monomethyl eth ether acetate is another solvent. So these are some solvents that are commonly found in nanofabrication. Deionized water, it's very pure water. Uh, it has a resistivity of 18 mega ohm centimeters at 25 degrees centigrade. This is the way people generally decide whether they have good deionized water or not by looking at its resistivity. If, if the resistivity is less than this, if it more easily passes an electric current, then this resistivity would allow, then you know it's got impurities in it. This is really pure, just H2O. And when it's really pure H2O, it has a resistivity of 18 mega ohm centimeters uh, at 25 degrees centigrade. And it's a very powerful solvent. Many, many things dissolve in water. It's often referred to as the universal solvent. We've already talked about several cases when we were dissolving things in water. So we said that 18 mega ohm centimeter number is an important one in fabrication and in manufacturing. You've got to monitor that to make sure that your water purity is being maintained that it doesn't contain any uh, impurities of any sort. Now, DI water is dangerous. Uh, it can leach salts out of the body, uh, which can be potentially fatal. So you have to realize that water, which we're also familiar with, uh, can become a potentially dangerous chemical when it's highly purified. And DI water is the highly purified version of water. It's, it is dangerous. DI, as you can see, stands for deionized. So all the impurities are taken out, all the ions are taken out. It's deionized. Acetone, uh, we mentioned this in our list of chemicals. It's a ketone, it's a uh, general pur purpose solvent often used for removing uh, uh, the first thing you might do to try to make sure you got or inorganic, excuse me, organic impurities off of something is to use acetone. Uh, it's a stripper. A stripper means uh, it's a chemical that strips off organics. It's extremely volatile. It's flammable. Now remember our classifications? We talked about flammable irritant. Well, it's flammable and an irritant. Uh, if the vapors are inhaled, you have to watch about its effect on the respiratory tract, and you have to worry about symptoms such as coughing, dizziness, and the headache. Uh, it can cause problem, so you have to watch high concentrations and prolonged exposure that really lead to problems of the nervous, central nervous system, liver, and kidneys. Uh, IPA, isopropyl alcohol, is an alcohol, one of the alcohols, uh, and uh, it's one that you certainly do not want to drink. Uh, it's, uh, but it is a general purpose cleaning solvent. It's, an, again, an organic stripper. It removes organics and uh, you can see our classifications, our general, when we were developing our vocabulary, you can see some of those terms showing up here. It's volatile, it's flammable, it's an irritant. An IPA uh, can affect the respiratory tract. Again, you have to watch out for symptoms like coughing, dizziness, and headache. And high concentrations can get serious and can actually lead to damage of the central nervous system. Trike. Trichloroethylene is a, a chlorinated hydrocarbon. It's, a, again, a general purpose cleaning solvent, very effective against organics. It's non-flammable, but quite dangerous. It's a carcinogen. Uh, if vapors are inhaled, 
the respiratory tract can be affected. It can cause central nervous system damage, uh, and prolonged exposure can lead to heart, lung, and kidney problems. And as we mentioned, it's a carcinogen, so prolonged exposure can lead to cancer. Um, ethylene glycol monomethyl ether uh, acetate is a, uh, an ether. It's used to dissolve uh, uh, organics, particularly resins. And you can see uh, from that vocabulary that we developed that uh, it can be classified as being a flammable material, an irritant, and it's a rotogen. So obviously a dangerous material, one that we have to be very careful with. Uh, sent, uh, respiratory and nervous system damage. Since it's a teratogen, it can cause birth defects uh, and uh, can cause liver, kidney, uh, testicle, and bone marrow damage. So, as we said, it's a teratogen, but it's also, in general, a dangerous chemical. Uh, some examples of, of uh, wet chemistry, just to close with a few examples. Piranha etch. This is um, an etch. Well, you can tell from its name, it's pretty vicious, it attacks everything. Piranha, those fish in the Amazon that attack everything. And it's a mixture of sulfuric acid and hydrogen peroxide. And it's very effective for removing organics that you don't want on something, and it's another way to take them off. Again, it's an in mixing, it's an exothermal reaction, we talked about that. Exothermal means it produces heat, so you have to be careful with it. Uh, you have to be very careful with its disposal, and you have to uh, uh, be very, very careful. In our teaching facility, we restrict its use only to the, the use by the staff because it's very, very dangerous. So I'd like you to appreciate that this is used in processing, but I'd like you to appreciate also that it's a very dangerous chemical. Well, this concludes our lecture number one uh, from unit one from the course Engineering Science 211. And we've been talking about safety and environmental issues. Uh, and in particular, in this lecture number one, we talked about general safety awareness. And then we started getting more specific and we talked about wet chemistry safety. Um, we can look at this outline and see what we're going to be covering uh, in succeeding lectures. We're going to cover gas, safe, gas safety biological safety, nanomaterial safety, energy safety, and environmental concerns. So I look forward to your joining me in lecture number two when we begin with gas safety.